Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas noches. Eh, mi nombre es Luis Martini y es un gusto estar con ustedes. El día de hoy tenemos a dos invitados especiales. Eh, conmigo está Cornelio Campos y en un momento les vamos a eh, decir quién está con nosotros. Seguramente ya saben, eh, hemos estado promocionando el evento. Eh, quiero dar las gracias a Revista Latina por el espacio que nos dan. Eh, aquí abajo van a poder ver su sitio web y la página de Facebook en donde nos pueden acompañar, en donde nos pueden eh, seguir. Eh, Cornelio, hola, ¿cómo hola. estás? Muy bien, emocionado ya que estamos de nuevo con otro nuevo episodio. Comenzamos con pintura, pero hoy tenemos a alguien especial y qué emoción. A... Y gracias a todos por estar de nuevo con nosotros. Luis, ¿cómo estamos? Bien, muchas gracias. Pues este, vamos a platicar un poquito de arte, vamos a platicar un poquito de algo que pues, nos ha interesado mucho en estos últimos días, una, una, eh, realmente una novedad eh, para nosotros como mexicanos, como artistas, eh, y sobre todo con el orgullo de pues, tener a, a una persona que pues, ha hecho arte aquí en Estados Unidos, ¿no? pero más que eso, pues eh, con la alegría de tener a nuestra invitada de hoy, eh, en un momento la vamos a, la vamos a presentar. Este, Cornelio, cuéntame rápidamente eh, de tu libro. Bueno, estamos, uh, como ya saben, presentando el libro. Uh, tenemos bastantes imágenes de el trabajo que he recopilado en los uh, últimos 20 años, desde luego no es todo mi trabajo, pero sí una buena colección que, que hemos hecho, desde luego gracias a Revista Latina tenemos esto, pero también quisiera uh, platicar un poco de esta persona que vamos a introducir, nos conocimos en el 2012 y hemos colaborado tal vez no en eventos importantes o tan desarrollados, pero sí en cuestión de amistad, entonces nunca imaginamos que hoy sería el día de tener dos libros juntos y sí. qué bueno, es una buena oportunidad de, de poder presentar a esta persona ya muy pronto. Muy interesante y me van a ver entonces, eh, en un ratito vamos a tener esta conversación, eh, la conversación va a ser en inglés eh, y pues sin más, pues, sin más presentación, vamos a comenzar, ¿no? Eh, Kate, ¿cómo estás? Ah, muy bien. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Thanks so much for being here. Um, thanks again, Cornelio. And tell us, what, what is the new that you have with us? Well, it is a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, buenas noches y gracias Luis y Cornelio y uh, Revista Latina Carolina del Norte. Es mi placer compartir esta noche con ustedes. Um, it is my pleasure to be here this evening and talk with you about Enrique Alferez, um, a preeminent Mexican artist who I have been studying in many ways since the mid-1990s when I first came to know his work while a student at the University of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And um, Alferez was um, a preeminent Mexican artist who lived almost the entire 20th century. And he left a significant mark on the visual landscape of the city of New Orleans and is a celebrated artist and figure and character in the living memory of New Orleans. And um, I'm just really looking forward to being able to talk with you this evening about some of his artwork and the way that it connects to his homeland of Mexico, his indigenous Nahua heritage, and his international outlook. Yeah, and it's very interesting. Uh, actually, we have here uh, a sculpture, uh, also your book. Uh, how was the process to, to write and to know all this uh, information, uh, did you travel? I did to, travel. To, to Mexico, right? I did travel to Mexico, and maybe I'll start with where it was that I came to know his work. 
Mm -hmm. um, there is a fountain that's in New Orleans that's called the Fountain of the Four Winds. Mm -hmm. um, it's at the New Orleans Lakefront Airport, which is one of the remaining Art Deco um, airports in the United States. And it was built in the early 1930s. And his fountain there um, is comprised of four mythical figures representing the four winds. Mm -hmm. And when I was a student and I was going through a very difficult time, I would go sit down by the fountain and I would look at the fountain and it just brought me a sense of peace in that way that I think that public art is a gift to us, that we can find solace in it. And little by little I wondered who created the fountain and then I went back to the library and learned a little bit more. And that was around 1995 or so. And since then I just feel like I've been walking alongside him learning more about his life and his artwork. Mm -hmm. When I began very diligently conducting the research for this book, it was about 2013. And I did make a very memorable visit to Marilia, where Alferez had a family home since, well, he moved to Marilia in 1969, and he had a home shortly thereafter there that is still with the family. And I was able to visit it and see the studio and the foundry where he worked and the backyard that was full of um, wonderful plants that he and his family had been growing throughout their lives and it was just so special to be able to write and um, investigate and learn about him right there in his home. Yeah, exactly. May I ask something? You think the connection between the art help you heal or help you in those difficult moments that you were going through when you got exposed to his art? His art? I think so, and I think it was also that I saw a kinship in him and in his life in that I recognized that over and over when he faced challenges and he had many throughout his life, he always seemed to triumph, or he didn't seem to triumph, he did triumph. And there were a number of moments that could have been setbacks for him, but instead opened up a new era or frontier in his artwork and in his life as well. And it gave me a sense of hope the more that I learned about him. And I also was just inspired by the artwork itself. And so there were those two different directions of learning about who he was as a person and who he was and what he created as an artist. He studied for, um, for uh, years with Laredo Taft, a preeminent American sculptor who wrote the first survey of U.S. sculpture. And he was in, um, he had a studio called the Midway Studios in Chicago. And Alvarez went to study there after, um, in, in the mid-1920s. And Taft said, he, Taft was a, frequent speaker on sculpture and also very knowledgeable about the biographies of sculptors. Mm -hmm. And he said that he always wanted to know what kind of man or person we would say today uh, someone was who created the sculpture that he admired. And it was with that kind of heart and inspiration that I really came to want to know more about Enrique Alferez. Yeah. Katie, um, this is your third book, right? And I'm very uh, interested in reading this book. And also, um, tell us a little about the poetry and if that poetry in some way, um, I don't know, was kind of an inspiration, then you wrote this uh, Alfaro's book. I would love to talk about that. So this is my third book. The other two books are books of poetry. One is a single long poem called State Street that was written after Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. And then the next book was, uh, it's a collection of poems called Through Water With Ease. And it's very different to write a collection of poems or a single poem than it is to write a biography. But I do see a lot of relationship between my what I think of as my creative writing in terms of poetry mm -hmm. and then in my study of art. And I really enjoy writing about art and artisans and their process. Something about watching artists work and seeing how they concentrate, how they use their hands, 
um, how they use their, their tools and the, the medium in which they work, for me is a kind of untangling that is similar to how we construct and deconstruct language. And so by watching the process and studying the process of artists, I feel like there's a very close relationship to how I approach my poetry. Um, there is a form of poetry called ekphrastic poems that are specifically about or in response to works of art. I've dabbled in this area just a little bit, but I do think that um, there's a, a connection in how I look at poetry and in then how I look at the visual arts too. And that I look for story, I look for narrative. Um, I like to think I see symbols everywhere. Yeah. And, um, and that was one of the things that drew me to Alferez's artwork as well, that I saw a lot of symbolism in it. Sometimes I saw, or I see, subtle and sometimes not very subtle socio-political aspects mm -hmm. to his work that spoke to me as well. Uh, Cornelio, I know you are an artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think about Alvarez's art? What I know about his art is that he is really focused a lot into um, make emphasis in a uh, woman and also about ethnicity, which is really um, something that have, have, hasn't changed. We still dealing with, and uh, we talking about last century, and we still uh, having issues with. So. I think that's the main thing. There are only few male artists who focus in a uh, woman specific, so that I really can like is the main uh, thing that I see on, on this art. I know you will be talking about this, right? The woman and the relation between art, woman, and all these artwork that he left as a legacy, right? Yes, I'd be happy to talk about that. Perfect. And, and really to reflect on um, what it was that drew me to his work that I saw in the female figures that he created. Mm -hmm. uh, he was drawn to the human form and to the female form in particular. Mm -hmm. And I admired that he created strength in the female figures that he created. Mm -hmm. There's a fountain in the Botanical Garden at New Orleans, um, in City Park, called Schriever Fountain, and it's a figure that was done in the 1930s, and she's carrying a vessel of water on her shoulder, which is long a symbol for female strength and care of family. Mm -hmm. He also created the first monument to um, a woman in the military in the United States, um, a woman in the Marines, it's named Molly Marine which is um, uh, an important figure for the Marines. And there were other female um, figures that he created in uh, bronze, in terracotta, in many mediums. One in particular that I think of as his iconic image, or iconic sculpture, is Woman in a Wipio. And we have one that's right here. I also brought a photograph with me in our would like to just talk a little bit about this sculpture in particular. Mm -hmm. It's one that Alferez revised a number of times, and it is an example of how he approached his sculpture in wanting to wanting to be able to more fully articulate human emotion in a figure and to represent it as honestly as he could, is how he put it. And this is a figure that he revised a number of times with continued changes in the nuance to how the figure holds herself. So here I have one that is um, a final execution of the sculpture, and you can see that there is a change in the direction of her head. So here she's looking to the side, and in this figure here, it, she's looking forward. And then also her hands change, and her planes change modestly as well. This is a figure that was, um, the, 
the larger image, the larger sculpture, I should say, that is currently in the Botanical Gardens in City Park, mm -hmm. is one that was exhibited in 1981 at the New Orleans Museum of Art. And it was a period in Alferez's life when he had previously been living in Mexico again in Morelia, um, really for um, more than a decade at that point. He did a lot of travel back and forth between various cities in Mexico and also to uh, New Orleans. But when he returned in 1981 and there was this exhibit at the New Orleans Museum of Art, the installation of Women in a Wipio was, she was a show stealer. And I think of it as a moment in which Alferez was able to make a connection between his roots mm -hmm. and um, one of his, you know, a chosen home mm -hmm. of New Orleans. Which is New Orleans. New Orleans. Yes. So that will be the connection between Mexico and New Orleans, right? Or, or what is the most important thing that connect or connects um, Mexico and New Orleans? I think there's a long-standing relationship between Mexico and New Orleans and there are um, both cultural and also economic connections. Um, New Orleans, when the Lakefront Airport was first opened, it was seen as a, a gateway to Latin America. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the 1920s and 1930s, so uh, when Alferez first arrived in New Orleans in 1929, there had been a group formed called the Arts and Crafts Club of New Orleans, which was in the French Quarter, and it gave artists a space to, um, to congregate, to meet, to do their art, to teach, um, for people to learn art as well and they had exhibitions, and there was a very close relationship with artists between members of the Arts and Crafts Club and also artists who were in Mexico, Orozco, uh, Diego Rivera, Siqueiros. There was an exhibition that Alferez had at the Arts and Crafts Club um, where work by Siqueiros was also exhibited at the same time. And when Alferez first moved to New Orleans in 1929, he ended up befriending a man named Franz Blum. Uh, Blum was a archaeologist, an archaeologist at Tulane University for what's now the Middle American Research Institute, and he conducted some um, early expeditions to various Maya sites. And in the early 30s, he had a commission to reconstruct the Nunnery Quadrangle mm -hmm. at Ishmael for the Chicago World's Fair. And Alferez um, was a part of it. He was the lead sculptor mm -hmm. in creating that replica. And Blum would frequently give talks at the Arts and Crafts Club, show slideshows from his visits. Mm -hmm. And there began an exchange between artists in Mexico, artists in New Orleans, and visits in both directions, as well as long-term stays. Uh, I'm curious about something. Um, probably, probably you don't know, or probably you know this, but I would like to know about his personality. <laughs> I understand with all that research, right, mm -hmm. that you did. So describe us a, a, a little about his personality. Well, he was a storyteller. All right. And um, in many ways, a, an entertainer in that regard. Um, it made him a rather kind of mythical figure in New Orleans, too. In some ways, it created a sense of mystery and excitement about who he was. I also think that it, in some ways, obscured who he was and allowed him to live as a more private man. Mm -hmm. Um, by not necessarily having to share the challenges that he had faced in life, mm -hmm. but to have more of um, a shield. Mm -hmm. And he was very dedicated to his artwork. He worked 12 hours a day. He would be in his studio by sunup. He would work very long hours. And um, he also 
there are a number of aspects of his life that lent themselves to a kind of sensationalism during his life. Mm -hmm. um, as I looked at many of these kinds of stories, I recognized that there were places where I was poking holes in some of those stories as well. Um, just to give you one example, yeah. many articles that were published about him say that he was married as many as 10 or 11 times, which sounds rather exciting. But this is not the case. <laughs> and even late in his life, when he was talking with a journalist named Donnelly Keith, he told Keith that he didn't know who had made up that story, but you know it might have been him. Yeah. And he um, he was married four times. The um, wife who he spent the longest period with through the end of his life was. Um, Peggy Selway, who he married in the early 1950s, and who really became an advocate for him, as well as giving him a sense of um, kind of order to the business of being an artist mm -hmm. as well. And she was a supporter of his and researched for and with him. And in many ways, his art was his family's work as well. Yeah, actually I see here you wrote about a controversy over one of his sculptures, uh, the name is The Fame, right? Uh, which caused him to be concerned his career was over. What caused this and how did he handle the situation? Well, I'm going to pick up on something that Cornelio said earlier when he was talking about art and the way that art looks at, you didn't use the word controversial topics, but I am, um, but you did talk about indigeneity and ethnicity and the way that art becomes both a reflection of people and also um, then opens up space for dialogue, which is what we, we hope our art does, is create dialogue. The family probably wouldn't have been the kind of sculpture that Alferez created that he would have expected the kind of response to that followed. It was um, it's a single figure of a joined family, a father, a mother, a, a child, and they're all nude. And it was commissioned to be installed, and it was installed at a municipal building in New Orleans. It was just down the street from a church. And there ended up being an uproar about the nudity of the figures. Um, it created a kind of scandal at the time that even reached newspapers around the United States and in Canada. And although locally there was um, some division in terms of the support or criticism of this work of art, and a lot of, a lot of the feedback from the community was still supportive, it, the, the crisis of it led Alferez to believe that his career as a sculptor was over. And it was a well-founded concern. Um, public commissions had been drying up already, um, although he had begun his career with many um, works funded through public projects under the WPA. Public funding for those kinds of projects dried up with World War II, and the large-scale commissions that he received after were just slowed, and they slowed for decades. But it turned his work toward smaller figurative sculpture. And it's also what ended up turning him in the direction that ultimately gave him the space to create works that truly reconnected with his homeland as well. Um, a series of charos, for example, um, some youth on burrows that are um, astonishing. They're about the size of the figure that's here on the table. And, and it ended up being um, a difficult situation that stung him for the rest of his life, even in um, instances in which that old issue came up, it seemed to stir in him an emotional response. But I do think that although it was a difficult time for him, it did open up a new path for him as an artist as well.
Yeah, so talking about uh, controver controversial issues, do you see any difference at that time uh, compared with the situation that we are living with social uh, problems or what, what do you see? Well, that is a very interesting question and because he lived virtually the entire 20th century from 1903 until 1999, social and cultural norms changed significantly through his whole life and the degree to which he was accepted varied by geography and time. And he definitely suffered the indignities of social exclusion and created works for places that he was not welcome to enjoy as well. And it gave him, I think, even more of a commitment to creating artwork that more people saw themselves in to give you just a, um, a couple of examples, or maybe one example, in City Park in New Orleans, which is a large, beautiful urban park with lagoons and majestic oak trees and wonderful paths. And, um, in City Park, there are a number of bridges that go over lagoons, and Alferez created some of the reliefs that are on the sides of bridges. And on one of them in particular, he created um, the representation of laborers who worked on the park. So um, men with a wheelbarrow or surveying equipment. And among the figures, he included African Americans as well. And it stirred a controversy in New Orleans. It was a time when the park was not open to African Americans. And Alferez defended his decision to include um, the figures, and he did so by saying that that they were talented craftsmen whose contributions were important to the park and the creation of it. And he also said that he knew what they had accomplished because he was with them. And when he said that, he meant both that he was working alongside them and that also he understood the exclusions that, that they um, that they faced. And there are other works by him, um, just for example, there's a church in New Orleans called Christ Church um, Chapel, actually, Christ Church Chapel, that has a series of putti, or little um, kind of cherub faces that you would see in a church. And Frequently, they are Caucasian faces, mm -hmm. and Alferez included um, a diverse range of peoples in these figures on the altar, um, on the rare dose um, of the chapel. And details like this illustrate both his international outlook as well as his commitment to ensuring that more people saw themselves in the work he created. Um, with all this uh, situation, I understand it's kind of sad, but also it's good that uh, the sculptor uh, in some way was recognized, right? And I have a question for Cornelio, uh, because I mean, I, 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 I understand also that you have been working with um, farm workers, right? Mm -hmm. So with all this research that Katie uh, did, what's your, what are your thoughts about what she's saying? Well, what I can uh, Tell about it is uh, I guess just the uh, time life change between the struggles are not the same but in somehow similar to today's struggles because um, we're still dealing with a um, uh, racial issue and also with recognition about uh, Latino artists here in the United States 
I think like I say, yes, uh, it's different century, but uh, I think the issues are very similar, I think. I think there are um, a number of reasons that he was not more well recognized outside New Orleans. Now, there are places where he is recognized, like El Paso, for example, where he lived um, where he lived as the, the first place he was in the United States. And also um, some in Chicago. And, and yet, I think that in his lifetime, he was very focused on doing his work, creating his work. Not so much on being known, but I also think that the time was very different and he would have faced more challenges being more widely recognized. I think now is a very important time for there to be a greater recognition of his work and of the importance of the way that he affected the visual landscape of New Orleans with so many works in public spaces and with there being um, a garden that's in his name, the Hellas Foundation Enrique Alferez Garden, that's in the Botanical Garden at City Park that has um, well over a dozen sculptures by him and that there are many ways that the city is celebrating him. And I think the book is, is a part of that as well in preserving his legacy and being able to share it more widely. So, do you have this sculpture, but also you have some pictures, right? I do have a few uh, could pictures. Could you show us? Yes, I'd be glad to show you a few pictures. So, the ones I wanted to show you, showed you women in a repeal. This is the Fountain of the Four Winds, you can see it. And this is the fountain that I visited, that I mentioned in the mid-1990s, that's very close to the University of New Orleans, that's at the Lakefront Airport. It is um, in need of a full restoration today. Some early stages of restoration have occurred, um, but it, it, it does need more attention. It has deteriorated over the decades since it was created in the 30s. The other photo that I wanted to share, this is um, a sculptor called La Solvadera, and um, I'm going to show you two photos of it. First, I'll just do um, one where you can see the entire figure. And she's holding her infant to her, and then she's also, what you can see behind her, there's um, a rifle behind her. And she's looking off to watch for any kind of oncoming threat. And one of the details that Alferez worked on very carefully with this sculpture was the position of the infant, which you can see a little bit better in this photo. And what he wanted to do was be able to create a sense of how at peace and unaware of any potential oncoming threat um, there was in the infant's figure while he's nursing and even the shape or the, the shape of the infant's feet give a sense of how relaxed and comfortable he was in the comfort of his mother. The figure also has some physical features of Alvarez's mother. Um, she was not a soldadera in the Mexican Revolution, but she did um, have a strength that he wanted to be able to portray in this, in this sculpture. And it's one that he began imagining in the 1930s. There are early signs of drawings that he was doing at that time. And then this figure was created in the 1970s. Perfect. Uh, Cornelio. So we have the writer here. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to hear a paragraph, maybe a chapter, or a little bit about the book? I hope Cornelio says yes. Yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah, we would I'm, love. We love to hear some of you. Well, thank you. I would okay. love to read some. What What is uh, what you're gonna read? I'm gonna pick up. Um, in the early 1920s, I think we're going to pick up at 1921 and then 1923. Alferez first crossed into the United States in 1919. He had served in the Mexican Revolution 
as a youth, where he ended up assigned to work with a man named Arevalo, who was an artist who had been hired to create a mural in Durango. And it was with Arevalo that Alferez crossed into the U.S. and lived together with Arevalo's family in El Paso, starting in 1919. And I'm going to pick up there where he had a couple of jobs and also where um, I think his, his understanding that his future was in sculpture began. So this is a section called Making a New Life in El Paso. Let me pull myself comfortable. Okay, I'll make myself comfortable too. <laughs> Enrique Alferez lived with the Arevalo family for some time, likely from 1919 until the artist's death in 1921. Between 1921 and Alferez's departure for Chicago in 1924, he lived in at least four different places in El Paso, sometimes living with an employer, and other times taking a room in a hotel. He found a position working at the Fine Arts Shop, which had opened in 1918 in the Roberts Banner Building in downtown El Paso. Alferez worked as a janitor, framer, and assistant, and he performed a number of tasks, from mopping floors and washing windows to antiquing frames and novelties. The fine art shop was run by Harry Wagoner, a painter who had previously lived in Chicago and who moved from Chicago to El Paso in search of a climate that was better suited for his health, given his history of tuberculosis. Wagoner's shop sold artworks, etchings, and other knickknacks. A motto for the shop was, you can live with art, but not so well. Alferez later said that there seemed to be less fine art in the shop and more mottos and frames, all those cliches people live by. While that may have been true to some extent, the fine art shop represented artists from El Paso, Santa Fe, and Taos, setting itself at the forefront of a burgeoning art scene. Alferez said he was paid $4 a week at the fine art shop. Wagner's interpretation of his compensation was slightly different although it added up to about the same in pocket money. Wagoner said he paid up Ferris $30 a month and that he had written to the youth's father to ask for permission to start a bank account for him. Half the wages granted in cash and the other half deposited. Wagoner proved helpful to Alferez in other ways too. He encouraged him to take English and penmanship classes. Wagoner's extensive connections in Chicago likely influenced the young sculptor's ideas about studying art there. Wagner also organized what was likely Alferez's first exhibition, a group show of 33 artists in a Chamber of Commerce building in El Paso in February 1922. Wagner's fine art shop was also frequented by some of El Paso's prominent residents, and it was through Wagner's relationship with Tom Lee II, a former mayor of El Paso, that Alferez met Lee's son Tom. The younger Tom was an artist and writer who later wrote the southwestern classic The Brave Bulls and he's recognized as a renowned painter of the U.S. Southwest. The two became friends and attended the School of the Art Institute of Chicago together, and Lee was a long, lifelong friend and supporter of Alferez's. When they met, Alferez was living in a small room at the Hotel Alamo on El Paso Street, and Lee thought of Alferez as very, very poor. Alferez became close with Lee's family. Even after moving to Chicago, he returned to El Paso periodically to visit with the Lees, and later in life, occasionally made journeys much longer than necessary when traveling between New Orleans and Mexico, making El Paso an intermediate stop so he could spend time with his old friend. The two continued corresponding throughout their lives as well, and decades later, Lee was instrumental in facilitating introductions that led to one of Alferez's two major exhibitions outside the city of New Orleans. The fine art shop was a vibrant, vibrant but short-lived part of the El Paso community, and it closed after only a few years in business. After working there, Alferez became a retoucher for the portrait photographer Fred Feldman, who photographed a number of El Paso's community leaders, including bankers, mayors, and judges. Feldman offered to leave Alferez his studio after his death, but Alferez wasn't interested in a career in photography, and by 1923 had settled on his next step. There had been a defining moment early that year, on a fair Monday evening, March 26, 1923. A slight chill set in after sunset, and there was frost in the valleys of El Paso. Alferez went to Liberty Hall to attend a lecture by Laredo Taft, the Dean of Public Sculpture in the United States. Taft was well known for his large beaux art style public fountains and monuments. 
When he visited El Paso that March, he'd already spent more than 30 years in affiliation with the Art Institute of Chicago, and he delivered lectures at the University of Chicago and the University of Illinois. He toured regularly as well, delivering hundreds of lectures on sculpture around the United States. And in 1924, published A History of American Sculpture, the first survey of the subject. He advocated for realism in the representation of the human figure and criticized the growing movement toward modern and abstract work. He frequently delivered clay talks, lectures illustrated by his on-stage modeling of clay or by a presentation of slides. In El Paso, Taft's stage was set with a table topped with clay and other tools and equipment. He had a paper mache replica of a bust by Michelangelo. And standing before the audience, he shaped clay into the face of Marie Antoinette, adding and removing material, giving attention to facial, facial muscles and wrinkles, until he had transformed the young Antoinette into an aged woman. Throughout the demonstration, he spoke to the audience about his process and sculpture more broadly, earning, quote, constant ripples of laughter in response to his, quote, homely philosophy and dry wit. That night, Taft also talked about the state of U.S. sculpture, saying that the country had not yet learned to express itself in art. We leave it for the foreigner who comes to this country to lead the way, he said. The evening resonated with Alferez. Even more than 60 years later, he said watching Taft on stage that night was like seeing magic. After the talk, Alferez and a few of his friends, including Tom Lee, went backstage to talk with Taft. Taft asked the boys, who's the genius here? And Lee pushed Alferez forward. Thanks so much. Thank you. What do you think? Well, I'm really curious. I know for a fact that you spent at least 10 years creating this book. 10 years? Yeah, because when we met, you start to talk about the. Um, you start a book, and now here we are with you, with your book. Um, I'm curious, can you tell us briefly how have changed your life by creating this book or how it's been influenced your personal life, I would say. Well, it's changed my life in so many ways. Um, to start with, just getting to know who Alferis was has been a very important way for me to understand how to um, always seek to better to better seek out understandings about differences that we have um, across people's societies, cultures, geographies. And that was that's just a way that he kind of affected my heart as a as a person. The process of writing the book though changed my life because it opened up so many doors to meet so many people. Um, I met Cornelio in 2012 um, in conjunction with one of his exhibitions, but Luis, this book is what made us have an opportunity to meet each other, and I met dozens and dozens of people in my research. I can say that sometimes as a writer, we think of the work we do as being rather solitary, but I always felt when I was working on this that there was a network of so many people out there who were a part of the fabric of storytelling with me. Some of them were um, family members of his, such as Pollock Alferez, his daughter, who is responsible for the stewardship of his estate today. And when she opened her door in New Orleans and invited me over the threshold into her house, and I was immediately surrounded by her father's sculpture. Um, it just, it took my breath away. And then to sit on her porch and have her open her heart and her memories to me was an incredible gift of trust and care that also has been very meaningful to me in terms of just what it, what it means to build very good, close, connected, deep friendships. 
And it also gave me a chance, the writing of this book gave me a chance to meet so many other people who knew Alferez during their lives or who understood his artwork and could help me to understand it better as well. Thank you so much. It's uh, an honor for us uh, to have you. Uh, I never thought that I would be, I would be uh, with a writer in a discussion of a book. And I just want to say thank you. Well, thank you, Luis, and thank you, Cornelia. This was a wonderful opportunity to be able to talk with you about Alferez's life and art, and I'm grateful for the time. And um, what's the message for the audience that we, we have here? Well, I think um, my message for the audience here is to learn more about Alferez's life and artwork and to look for ways that you can see yourself in his art as well. Um, of course, I would love if you read the book. Yeah, um, well, go ahead, go ahead. But in addition to that, there are many wonderful websites where you can also peruse his artwork, places in the United States where you can see his work, certainly in New Orleans at the Botanical Garden, um, at, in a number of places in uh, public spaces in New Orleans, also in Marilia. There are sculptures in public spaces. At, um, uh, there's a Benito Juarez sculpture, for example, near the zoo in Morelia. And I think it's important to celebrate the accomplishment that this preeminent Mexican artist had on the influence of US art. Yeah. Um, after you, thank you so much. After you read the book, I just want to read it too. <laughs> uh, where can I buy it? Well, you can get it online directly from the Historic New Orleans Collection, which is the publisher. And it's also available through Barnes & Noble. Um, your local bookseller can definitely order it for you, and you can also find it on Amazon. Uh, so we will have the information in our um, in our life here in the, in the comments and um, you don't have launched the book right the book is going to be officially launched it is available now um, this entire COVID period has made book launches a little bit different than right. yeah. so we're going to have a, um, an event on May 4th on zoom um, and there is a link that I think will also be shared where you can register for it. It will be co-hosted by the Historic New Orleans Collection, the Botanical Garden at City Park, and supported by the Hellas Foundation, which supports the arts in Louisiana. Perfect. Um, and it's on May 4th because that's Alferis' birthday. Yeah. Oh, I know the good thing. Yes. Um, so is there a link, you said, for the registration? There, there is a link. Um, but through, the, through the website of the, what's the name? The, um, the I will share the link with you. It's a, it's a long URL. So I'll right. share it with you so we can post it. With we, we, we have it you here. Have it. Okay. Yeah. So what else? Tell us. Well, this was just, this was um, a wonderful evening to be able to be in conversation with both of you, two wonderful artists, and to have a chance to talk about Alferis' work. Mm -hmm. And um, I appreciate your attention to it and giving me an opportunity to talk with you about it. Thanks so much. And again, I would like to thank uh, Revista Latina for sharing the space um, here with us. And of course, um, to to have us uh, with uh, Facebook with uh, Cornelio also. Uh, thank you again for Gracias. Gracias. sharing. Gracias. And I'm gonna switch to Spanish. Okay. To Spanish. I'm sorry, a little bit. Uh, gracias a todos eh, por estar con nosotros. Eh, seguramente este no va a ser el último de Facebook like que vamos a hacer 
the, uh, oh, I just wanted to, to mention something again. Well, no, not again. Um, you said something about uh, the friendship. And of course, this won't be the last time that we're gonna talk, right? Um, it won't be the last time. Okay. It's, it is um, a joy to be connected with both of you, and I look forward to um, many ways that we'll keep connecting. Perfect. Um, Cornelia, algo más que podamos agregar? Bueno, pues darle las gracias al público que nos acompañó y como Luis menciona, no será la última vez y estaremos compartiendo el link de donde va a ser la... donde la escritora va a compartir un poco y leer el libro. Um, could you... I have, I have a question here. Uh, could you share... Uh, the address in New Orleans of the house or the studio? Of the so his house and studio in New Orleans is a it's a private home. Okay. It is um, only open by appointment. All right. It um, there are many places in the city that you can also see his work in public space, from the Central Business District to the Lakefront Airport. Um, architectural details and buildings and if there is interest in seeing his home studio I'd be very glad to connect with someone about that personally and see what might be possible. Perfect, so we already have the information uh, is a private studio and just with an appointment, right? Perfect. Um, your book with uh, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles what else? Um, directly from the Historic New Orleans collection, and then one of my favorites would be to contact your local bookseller and ask them to order a copy for you. Perfect. With your signature. Right? I'm happy to inscribe. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Cornelio, uh, your your book, where can we uh, get it? Bueno. Para la gente que está cerca, personalmente tengo algunos disponibles y desde luego uh, por medio de, de Amazon. Por ejemplo, Amazon. De, en futuro compartiré el, el link y desde luego pueden entrar a mi Facebook o también pueden entrar por medio de uh, el website corneliocampos.com. Perfecto. Um, my book is also accessible through my website of katiepollerjohn.com Yes. Perfect. Um, well, the honor has been mine uh, for having two great artists on my right side and my left side. Thanks so much again for uh, having this time with us and uh, my thought about Alf Ferris is that as a Mexican probably he left a huge legacy but it's hidden. We have to make it less hidden. Exactly. Well, thanks to you. <laughs> Thank you. Bueno, gracias a todos por acompañarnos. Ha sido un placer y como dije ha sido un honor. Eh, tener a dos grandes artistas en esta discusión, eh, Enrique Alférez, escultor, con Katie Bowler John. Thank you. Cornelio, gracias. 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 Gracias a todos. Nos vemos pronto.